First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Adna and Dr. Shechkin for starting the EFA because I really think that there are very important things that they're trying to uh, progress in terms of early recognition. I think it was <coughs> a perfect segue with Lizzie talking before me because you know she had endometriosis involved in the bowel, and that's one of the things that is a very difficult thing to diagnose. And patients, you know, the average patient it takes seven to nine years to get diagnosed. And patients with bowel endo probably take maybe, you know, even five more years than that. So again, it's a very difficult thing. And what I'm going to do is try to navigate you through one of the problems dealing with IBS and endometriosis of the bowel um, and try to make it a little bit more clear as to how we can try to deal with that. Um, you know, what I'm going to talk to you today about is when is endo of the bowel um, uh, not IBS um, and what your gynecologist or gastroenterologist doesn't know or might not want to tell you. Um, as you know, uh, endometriosis is very common. affects 10% of women. Um, it includes painful periods, pelvic pain, painful intercourse, bladder symptoms, backache, bowel symptoms. Um, bowel symptoms are very, very common, okay? They can include <coughs> constipation, diarrhea, intestinal cramping, and painful bowel movements. As well, it may include bloating and nausea. Um, in our experience, about one-third of our patients have constipation. Um, probably two-thirds or more have diarrhea. Um, often it's menstrual, but sometimes it could be throughout the cycle, or sometimes it can be alternating with constipation and diarrhea. About 40% have intestinal cramping. 20% um, have painful bowel movements. Um, you know, what, you, what the average gynecologist is going to do when they come across these symptoms, they're not going to focus on the fact that you have pelvic pain. They're going to focus on the fact that you have these GI symptoms, and that's not my thing. So they're going to send you to a gastroenterologist. Or if you have any bladder symptoms, they're going to send you to a, a urologist. So unfortunately, that helps to delay the diagnosis. And often patients will be sent to a gastroenterologist not only one time, maybe two, three, four, five times to get different opinions. Irritable bowel syndrome has many different names. Um, it's also, spastic colon, uh, irritable colon, spastic colitis. Um, my wife and I went to see uh, Kat and I had hot tin roof last night. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if anyone's seen that or read the book. But in that, the, the father, Big Daddy, he, uh, he has spastic colon, you know. And, um, you know, it ended up being cancer. But for most endo patients, the risk of that is extremely small. Um, in terms of cancer, I've never had an endo patient develop cancer to my knowledge. <coughs> so just put it in perspective. Again, um, symptoms include abdominal pain, less so in the pelvis, and that's something to kind of help differentiate it. Intestinal cramping, constipation and diarrhea. Again, some may have predominantly one or the other, or some may have both. Um, and then um, bloating and fullness, sometimes which is relieved by bowel movements. It's not the same as inflammatory bowel disease, which includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, which are separate conditions which are diagnosed on colonoscopy. Um, IBS, about one in six people have IBS. Um, women are twice as uh, likely to have it uh, compared to men. Sometimes you can get what's called a post-infectious uh, irritable bowel syndrome in which you've had an infection, that tends to be less common, but it can occur. The one thing that happened with patients who have IBS and endometriosis is the fact that a lot of their symptoms occur at the same time. They start having these symptoms early on in their teens or, or early 20s, which is really the same time that women with endo start having their symptoms as well. Over 80% of women with endo you know, have painful periods as their initial symptoms. And so, you know, again, they're dismissed for a number of years saying, well, that's just normal, you know, kind of deal with it. But um, ultimately, they end up developing more symptoms, which finally end up getting them with diagnosis. In terms of um, working, at, working up a patient with bowel symptoms, um, the first thing you want to rule out are other things like lactose intolerance, um, gluten enteropathy or gluten intolerance. Um, and that's a sensitivity to wheat, uh, barley, rye, and possibly oats. Uh, 
um, inflammatory bowel disease, which is uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's again, and cancer, again, usually patients with IBS don't have these symptoms, but may present with weight loss or blood in their stools. It's really a diagnosis of exclusion. Once the gastroenterologist has ruled out these other things, then they can you know, make the diagnosis of IBS. So it's kind of their wastebasket for you know, someone who presents with bowel symptoms. Can't find a reason for it, so uh, you know, they must have IBS. In terms of tests that they do, they can do blood tests to rule out uh, gluten enteropathy. They can also do stool cultures to rule out infectious causes. Um, often they'll do an endoscopy, which is basically inserting a tube down your throat and then looking in the stomach and into the duodenum and possibly biopsying the duodenum to rule out celiac disease. And finally, a colonoscopy to rule out uh, cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> in terms of endometriosis and IBS, this was actually a very easy talk to do because there really isn't very much in the literature. When you look at um, endometriosis articles in PubMed, which is the, the resource that tells you every article that's been published on a certain area, there was about 20,000 articles on endometriosis. When, they look, when you look at IBS, there's a little over 8,000. When you look at endo and IBS, there was 40, of which I thought five had anything wrong. So there really wasn't very much to summarize. The first study um, looked at patients with endometriosis undergoing laparoscopy. They confirmed that endometriosis in about 85% of those women. 90% uh, of them had some bowel symptoms. So you can see how easy it is for them to get steered in the wrong direction at IBS. Um, they actually found direct involvement in only 8% of patients. So there's other things going on like the peritoneal fluid and inflammatory mediators, which are probably, you know, uh, having something from the endo secreted into that tissue, which is affecting the bowel. Um, so basically the conclusion was that bowel symptoms are very common, but it doesn't mean that uh, bowel involvement is there all the time. Uh, the next study was Ballard. Um, they looked at about 5,500 patients, and they found that they were looking for symptoms associated with endo. Of course they had all the classical symptoms of endo, but they were much more likely to be diagnosed with IBS or PID or pelvic inflammatory disease as well. And even after diagnosis with endo, they are still two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with IBS, uh, even after uh, they've been confirmed to have diagnosis. And that probably has to do with the fact that more often than not, their, their endo wasn't treated properly. Uh, finally, um, uh, one, one group looked at rectovaginal endometriosis or endometriosis in between the rectum and the vagina, which is more likely associated with deep disease of the bowel. And they found that painful bowel movements were very likely to be predictive of endometriosis involving the bowel. As well, um, just aperunia or avoiding intercourse was very likely because there, if there's pain, if there's endo in the rectovaginal septum, it's going to cause a lot of pain with intercourse as well. Um, finally, Nausea and bloating were also very common. Um, and so basically they concluded that, yes, the symptoms of IBS are very common in women with endo. In terms of looking at colonoscopy, uh, colonoscopy uh, basically is taking a flexible tube, uh, inserting it through the anus and looking all the way through the large bowel into where the small bowel joins the large bowel. Um, findings that may suggest endometriosis include tortuous bowel or a bowel that they had a hard time getting through that suggests either adhesions or invasive <laughs> disease. Um, unfortunately, colonoscopy is very, very poor at picking up endometriosis on the bowel. If you look at all the patients with endo on the bowel, which probably makes up around 20 or 30 percent of patients, they, can, they can't see the superficial disease which occurs probably 90 percent of the time. Invasive disease is probably only picked up five or 10% of the time. So colonoscopy is a very, very poor tool at picking up patients who have endo in the bowel. Well. Most of the time, they'll have enough, and then they'll get the diagnosis of IBS. Other tests, CT scan, MRIs, they're not very accurate unless you have big bulky disease, which most women don't have, okay? Virtual colonoscopy is a newer uh, technique, which looks at, it's actually doing a CT scan, 
for patients who've had a certain bowel prep, and they can actually pick up the endometriosis or pathology involving the bowel probably over 90% of the time. But unfortunately, it's very new technology, which probably only have a few centers in the US that have it already. And finally, transvaginal ultrasound after an enema. It's very sensitive, but there's very few places that are trained to do it in the US. Um, Dr. Abreu, who's going to be talking tomorrow, um, his center does it. Um, but again, there's very few centers in the US that do it. The, the gold standard is laparoscopy, OK? That's the only way to make sure that you have it. And the gold standard for laparoscopy is when you actually go in and excise all the disease <coughs> instead of treating it superficially, OK? When it's excised properly, the chances of the end of recurring are very small. And the chances of being pain free indefinitely are over 80 to 85 percent. Unfortunately, most gynecologists don't excise disease. They go in and they try to destroy it. When that's done, there's a very, very high chance of it coming back as much as 80 percent within two years. This is looking at some slides. Um, this is the appendix right here. And this is the tip. You can see the tip is swollen here. And then there's actually scarring between the tip and the rest of the appendix. This is a small bowel endo, which is probably very similar to what Lizzie had. You see here's some lesions here, here, here. And there's actually some narrowing of the bowel. You see how the bowel is being kind of pinked in this area. And that's suggestive of invasive bowel disease. This is endometriosis involving the large bowel. Here we've got a probe inside the rectum. And you can see how the bowel is being pexied or tethered up here to the uterosacral ligament behind the uterus. This is as we're working, we have a probe in the rectum. We've made an incision around the nodule. And we basically completely excise it. Here we're just about to finish excising that nodule. And then that's the, that's the specimen itself. There's a little bit of thinning of the bowel, so we reinforce it with some sutures. Um, this is a more advanced case in which we've already done the bowel resection because the endometriosis had caused a narrowing of her bowel. And um, subsequently, we had to cut out that piece of bowel that was involved and uh, reconnect the bowel. This is that part that you saw before. And this is the other part of the bowel, which is both parts are now healthy. And they've been reconnected with a stapling device. And all the other endometriosis that's been present in the pelvis has been completely removed. This is the same patient's pathology. You can see here is the normal thickness of the bowel, which is about four millimeters, OK? You can see this area of the bowel where the endometriosis has been dated. It's about two or three times as thick as it normally should be. You can see here is what the normal opening of the bowel should be. And you can see that this one is probably about, once it's brought back together, maybe a third or half as wide as it should be. So you can see why people would have a lot of constipation. Anything trying to come through there would be very painful. The bowel, the normal bowel, stretches a lot. Bowel with endometriosis and scarring doesn't stretch as much. So again, that's another source of the pain that these people are going to be experiencing. Uh, just some numbers, it probably occurs between 15 and 20% of patients overall. Um, most of that is uh, not invasive. Um, uh, we, in our experience, we probably have 20% uh, of our patients with some sort of involvement of the bowel, whether it's bowel being scarred to the back of the uterus with some superficial disease. And only about 4 or 5% of our overall patients, or around 20% of them that have endo on the bowel, will require a bowel resection. Um, again, most of it is in the pelvis or in the area just above the vagina, called rectovaginal or sigmoid or uh, larger intestine as it's entering the bowel. Um, and 10% involve a small bowel, like it did in uh, Lizzie's case. 80% um, of their patients will have long term improvement in their bowel symptoms, whether or not the disease is invasive or not. Actually, an invasive disease, it's probably about 98 or 99 percent will have significant improvement in their symptoms. When to suspect uh, invasive endometriosis of the bowel? Well, probably the number one thing is painful bowel movements. Okay, when patients are having painful bowel movements, uh, 
that's the, the, really the herald that there's probably either adhesions involving the valve, um, where the valve is being kinked and it has to go through a narrowing, or there's actually invasive disease, which is causing a narrowing as well. Alternating constipation and diarrhea is a very uh, common symptom as well. What happens is patients um, will often have a hard time having a bowel movement, maybe several days or even weeks in some situations. And then when they finally do have a bowel movement, they tend to almost have like a reflex diarrhea where they tend to clear out whatever's in their bowel above the obstruction, okay? Um, intestinal cramping um, and bloating are very common. And sometimes that can be a little bit more suggestive of small bowel disease if they're having localized pain like Lizzie was because often they'll have right lower quadrant pain, which is very close to the appendix. That's where the small bowel joins the large bowel. And so they'll have other symptoms like that, which are a little bit more related to the small bowel. Um, blood in the stool, a lot of patients will say they have blood in their stool. And sometimes that can be because of constipation and hemorrhoids, which they may not see because they're internal. Um, if it's bright red blood, it's usually associated with hemorrhoids. But if it's old, dark brown blood, or it's very mucousy, again, that would suggest invasive disease of the bowel. Um, and or palpable, the final, last thing is if a doctor is doing a rectovaginal exam or examining a patient um, deeply into the higher, the higher part of the vagina on the back wall, they may feel a mass, which is also suggestive of endo involving the bowel. Um, these are some important questions to ask <coughs> the gynecologist in general and then specifically with regards to bowel symptoms. Um, the most important thing is how are they going to treat the disease, okay? There's many ways to excise endometriosis. You can use cold scissors like Dr. Sechkin. You can use a laser as a cutting tool, um, not to destroy it, but to actually cut up the disease. You can use monopolar energy, which is basically using electrical energy as a cutting tool. Um, and then there's other forms of energy as well that will work. The bottom line is do they excise or do they treat it superficially? <coughs> and that's a huge difference in terms of outcomes. Excision is much better. Um, what if they found endo in the bowel? Are they going to treat it? Most gynecologists would say probably not because if they're using some form of energy to destroy the endo, they're worried about actually injuring the bowel, so they're not going to even touch it. Um, have they ever treated or seen any invasive bowel in interest? And again, most are going to say no, and it's, it's going to be something that they're going to leave behind. So if you are seeing someone and they're not giving you the right answers, then it may be you know, time to go to see someone who's a specialist in endometriosis. Um, and what would they do if they found an obliterated cul-de-sac or invasive end up? An obliterated cul-de-sac is where the bowel is stuck to the back of the uterus, which is probably found in around 20 to 30% of patients. Again, most gynecologists feel very apprehensive about treating that because they're worried about getting into the bowel and what would they do if they did that. Again, because they don't routinely do that, they are going to be apprehensive. And fortunately, it can be treated well and all, that, all the anatomy is restored to normal in an expert's hands. And you don't want them to feel like this. Um, you don't want them to say, well, I'll deal with it when I get there. You know, because you want someone who's experienced to do that. Because bowel complications can be very high in unexperienced hands, and uh, it's pr they're probably not going to get rid of all the disease. Thank you. <coughs> I would like to uh, um, acknowledge Dr. Harry Rich, who um, was one of the pioneers in endometriosis surgery and uh, has actually done some procedures which we adopt ourselves, like doing segmental resections with just a stapling device. Um, uh, as Harry, would you stand up? And, and uh, he was one of the, the definite pioneers in endometriosis surgery. And um, you know, had it not been for his foresight, we probably wouldn't be as advanced as we are today.